Let's start by looking at passive transport mechanisms. Again, these are the mechanisms that don't require energy because we're allowing molecules to move down their concentration gradient. The simplest form of passive transport is simple diffusion. In simple diffusion, molecules simply move across the plasma membrane on their own from areas of high concentration to areas of lower concentration. This doesn't require any energy and it doesn't require any transport proteins. The molecules just wiggle across the membrane and go to the areas of lower concentration. Because there's no transport protein to help, this only works for small nonpolar molecules. An example would be oxygen diffusing from your lungs into your blood. Oxygen is a small and nonpolar molecule. It just wiggles across membranes to get from your lungs into your blood. Carbon dioxide works the same way. Carbon dioxide is small and relatively nonpolar, and it just diffuses across the membranes from your blood into your lungs so you can breathe it out. This only works because we have a higher level of carbon dioxide in the blood and a lower level of carbon dioxide in the lungs. So it'll diffuse from the blood into the lungs. Simple diffusion is great for small nonpolar molecules, but a lot of the molecules we need to get in or out of cells are not small and nonpolar. A lot of them are polar or charged. So we need a little bit of help to get those in and out. That brings us to facilitated diffusion, which is basically diffusion with a little bit of help. In facilitated diffusion, we use a transport protein to provide an opening that allows molecules to move from one side of the membrane to the other, moving down their concentration gradient. So the molecules are still going to move from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration, but we give them a tunnel that they can go through. There are a couple of different types of transport proteins that allow facilitated diffusion. One is what's often referred to as a carrier protein. A carrier protein binds to a molecule on one side of the cell, changes shape, and releases that molecule on the other side of the membrane. A good example of this would be a glucose transporter that binds to the glucose transport molecule on the outside of the cell, and then that molecule changes shape to release the glucose on the inside of the cell. This is only going to work as long as the concentration of glucose outside the cell is higher than the concentration of glucose inside the cell. That's usually the case since cells are constantly using up glucose inside. That keeps the intracellular concentration of glucose low so that more glucose can keep coming in. Carrier proteins tend to be very specific. What that means is that each carrier protein is only going to be able to transport a certain type of molecule. The carrier protein that can transport glucose is not going to be able to transport amino acids. It might not even be able to transport fructose. And that's because a carrier protein has to be just the right shape to bind to the molecule it's transporting. If it's a different shape molecule, it's not going to work in the carrier protein. Let's look at an animation of a carrier protein. I'd like to give thanks to John Giannini at St. Olaf College for giving me permission to record these animations for you. Here are the credits for these animations. This animation shows a glucose molecule being transported from the outside of the cell into the inside of the cell through a carrier protein. A second type of transport protein that's important for facilitated diffusion is an ion channel. An ion channel opens a tunnel through the membrane that allows ions to flow through. So we don't have to bind to each one individually and move it, they just flow through the tunnel when the tunnel is open. An example of this would be the calcium channels that allows calcium to flow into muscle cells to cause a muscle contraction. Most ion channels aren't open all the time. Most ion channels are gated. What it means to be gated is that sometimes the ion channel is closed, and then when it receives a signal, the ion channel is open, and then a different signal might close the ion channel again. That allows the cell to regulate when the ions can flow through and when they don't. There are lots of different types of signals that can open gated ion channels. These include changes in charge, changes in pH, 
changes in temperature, the presence of a signal that will bind to the ion channel. All of these are ways that, that different gated ion channels can be opened. Let's look at an animation of ion channels. In this non-gated channel, ions simply flow through the tunnel that's formed through the plasma membrane. Here are potassium ions moving from the outside to the inside of a cell. In this animation of a gated ion channel, you can see that the ion channel is closed at first, and then when a signal comes in, it opens the channel to let these calcium ions through. The last of the passive transport mechanisms to talk about is osmosis. We can think of osmosis as being the diffusion of water. In this case, the solute molecules stay where they are, but water will move from one side of a membrane to the other side of a membrane. The reason for this is remember that water is attracted to solutes. Water likes to surround solute molecules. If we have more solute on one side of a membrane than on the other, water will be attracted to the area with the most solute. This movement of water, or the attraction of water by these solutes, is referred to as the osmotic pressure. Osmosis is really important for a number of body functions. For example, water and small molecules are pushed out of your blood vessels by your blood pressure. So the push of the blood through your vessels pushes water and small molecules out into your tissues. Osmosis pulls water from your tissues back into the blood vessels again. That's because there's all that solute, all those things left in the blood that attract water back into the blood vessels. This is important to keep us from getting a lot of swelling or edema from lots of extra fluid left over in our tissues. Osmosis pulling water back into the blood vessels. Here's an animation that shows osmosis. At first you'll see the water molecules move randomly back and forth across the membrane. But once salt is added to one side of the membrane, then the water molecules are attracted to the salt, and more of them move over to the side of the membrane with salt. The amount of solute in the solution surrounding a cell has an effect on the movement of water in and out of the cell. Let's start by considering a cell in a hypertonic solution. In a hypertonic solution, the concentration of solute on the outside of the cell is much higher than the amount of solute inside the cell. Remember that water wants to move to areas of higher solute concentration. Water will move from the inside of the cell, where there's a lower concentration, to the outside of the cell, where there's a higher concentration of solute. As water is moving out of the cell, this can cause the cell to shrink and shrivel. Let's consider the opposite situation, where we put a cell in a hypotonic solution. A hypotonic solution has less solute in the solution than is inside the cell. This is what would happen if we took a cell and put it in plain water. Water doesn't have solute in it, so there would be very low solute outside the cell and a much higher level of solute inside the cell. In this case, water wants to move from the outside to the inside of the cell, where solute is more concentrated. As water moves into the cell, the cell can swell and even burst. The ideal solution for cells is an isotonic solution. In an isotonic solution, there's the same amount of solute in the solution around the cell as there is inside the cell. That means that water moves in and out at the same rate and we don't have any swelling or shrinking. One last thing about osmosis. We're talking about the movement of water back and forth across the membrane. And water is small enough that it can wiggle across the membrane on its own, but it's very polar so it can't cross very easily. In order to make it easier for water to move in and out of cells, a lot of cells have a transport protein called aquaporin. Aquaporin opens a channel through the membrane that will allow water to move in and out of the cell.